This summer we have been preaching on a general theme, setting the captives free. And um, today we have before us the liberation of Paul and Silas. The lesson has been read from Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, and I'm not going to reread uh, those verses, but I will acknowledge that one of the greatest accounts in the Bible about prisoners being set free is the liberation of Paul and Silas. The story begins, and this is Acts chapter 16, the story begins um, actually with verse 16. Acts chapter 16, verse 16 and following. And what you find is that these two men, Paul and Silas. Now, I want you to think about this from where we, well, it really is the only option we have. We have to read Bible stories from where we sit, okay? And we sit at a time when stuff happens to people when they're minding their own business. They end up locked up in jail. So just keep a contemporary mindset as you're listening to this story. These two men are on their way to prayer meeting. Okay? They, there's a prayer meeting. They were going to meet with the women who gathered by the river to pray. That's where they were going. And when they were on their way to the prayer meeting, they encountered a young woman who had been enslaved by some men who profited from her demonic ability to tell fortunes. Now, these men weren't like the priest and the Levite in the story of the Good Samaritan. They didn't just keep watching, oh, I got to go to prayer meeting. I don't have time to stop. But they encountered this woman, and they saw that she had a demonic ability. And, I mean, you can do the research and you have your opinion about whether demons exist or not. But there are people who have ability to do things that comes from God. And there are people who have ability to do things that comes from Satan. And so this woman, this young woman, had the ability to tell, to forecast the future. But it was demonic. It was not a gift of the Holy Spirit. It was a gift of an evil spirit. And so these men decided that they could make money by using her to tell people's fortune, and then they collected the money. Well, when Paul and Silas encountered this young woman, they cast the demon out of her. And when her owners, we use that, you know, because it's really, it's, it's so horribly immoral and illegal for one human being to own another, but that's how slavery operates. That's how human trafficking operates. I'm telling y'all to listen to this story from a contemporary point of view. Uh, they had control of her, and the whole thing was about them making money. And once, she, once that demonic spirit was out of her, she didn't have the ability to make them any more money. And so what they decided after they realized that he had messed up their money-making opportunity, Paul and Silas. They then attacked them with false accusations. And so wasn't the accusation uh, was not um, they, we, we, we don't like what they did to the young woman. The accusation was not about um, the money, but they brought them before the Roman officials and said, these men are Jews and they are causing trouble in our city. They're teaching customs that are against our law. We are Roman citizens and we cannot accept these customs or practice them. And the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas. Then the officials tore the clothes off Paul and Silas, and ordered them to be whipped after a severe beating. They were thrown into jail, and the jailer was ordered to lock them up tight. Upon receiving this order, the jailer threw them into the inner cell, that's sort of like solitary confinement, and fastened their feet between heavy blocks of wood. So they went from 
an act of mercy and compassion for a young woman to being publicly stripped and beaten and put into jail. No trial, false charges, and then they're locked up in this prison. It just happens all in an instant, and they really have not done anything wrong. Naked, bleeding, and chained at midnight, they began to sing hymns. Okay? They're naked. They stripped, their, they stripped them. Before they locked them up, they stripped them to humiliate them. Then they beat them. And they beat them unmercifully. And they locked them up. They didn't say they put their clothes back on. Didn't say that they did anything about their wounds. They locked them up. And what you, if you follow the story carefully, you find that the jailer has to bring a light after the earthquake. So they're in the dark. And what are they doing? Singing praises to God. Let me try that again. Naked, bleeding, chained, incarcerated on trumped up charges. They... In the dark, sang hymns. And when their praises went up, everybody's chains fell off. All of the prisoners. See, there was all kinds of people locked up in that jail. You don't know what they did or why they were there. But we do know that Paul and Silas were there to sing praises. And there was an earthquake. That's how God moves sometimes, an earthquake. And when the praises went up, the earth shook, and everybody's chains. Shoot, 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 shoot. All the prisoners were released from their chains. And then the jailer, they said the jailer got to ask for a light. He called for a light to see what had happened. And when he brought his light into the prison, he didn't know what to do. In fact, let me go back to that scripture. The jailer woke up after everybody's ch- I guess he heard those chains falling off. Or maybe it was the earthquake that shook him awake. But the jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he was responsible for those prisons. He's like the warden. He's the jailer. And he thought they had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sir, what must I do to be saved? I just want you to observe that some kind of way the jailer already knew they were saved. You know, they didn't, they didn't present the four spiritual laws. He was like, y'all must be, this is something about y'all. God has moved. What do I have to do to get some of what y'all got? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others. In his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. I told you they were naked, bleeding, and chained in the dark. The chains fell off. The light came on. I guess he gave them some clothes to put on, but he washed their wounds. And then immediately he and all his household were baptized. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us you know, where they found the water, you know, we, we're not going to worry about that. But they were baptized some kind of way in the middle of the night. The jailer brought them into his house, his house. 
and set a meal before them. In other words, the jailer now is showing them hospitality, gracious hospitality. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his household. Um, let me get back to my message. The first thing the jailer did when he saw that something he was awakened was to I want to we we're from if you're familiar with this story you know he asked the question what must I do to be saved but I want you to hear that question as a confession of his ignorance okay that he didn't know what to do he just wanted to be saved but he was willing to say Tell me what I need to do. I've confessed my ignorance, but if you tell me, I want to do what you tell me to do so that I can be saved. Sometimes it, it, we don't have to be ashamed of ignorance. What you need to be ashamed of is stupidity. Stupidity is something to be ashamed. Stupidity means that you don't know and don't care that you don't know and nobody can tell you. Ignorance means you just don't know. There's no shame in ignorance. And so he's saying, tell, please tell me, what do I need to do to be saved? He's confessing his ignorance. And he demonstrates the authenticity, the sincerity of his inquiry by washing their wounds and offering them hospitality and food and shelter. They didn't, he didn't put them in, he didn't let them stay. Didn't, didn't make them stay in that place where they were, but he brought them to his own house. And but, but, as all of this happened, Paul and Silas remained in custody. They remained in custody. When the Roman police officers and judges then tried to release them quietly, I want you to get this. Okay, the chains went off. They had the good meeting, evangelistic meeting. The jailer got saved. They had some food. He, he dressed their wounds. So everybody's happy. Everybody's rejoicing. But they're still in custody. They didn't run off. They didn't walk off. They're still in custody. So the Roman police officers who arrested them and the judges who sent them to jail then tried to release them quietly and say, Okay, since all this happened, y'all can just go. And Paul and Silas refused to go without an apology and an acknowledgement of the injustice. See, it's some, for some reason as Christians, we don't, we don't want to go there. We just want to shout about, oh, Paul and Silas got out of jail. And we want to shout about that. But I want you to pay attention to what happened after they got set free. That's why more of us are not set free, because we don't know what to do with the freedom that the Lord gives us. And your freedom is connected to somebody else's bondage. So you don't just say, okay, we out, we out, we got free. No, everybody's chains fell off. And then when, it was, when the whole thing could have just ended, well, y'all free to go. Uh-uh, no, you, you can't just do all of this injustice to us and expect us to just go away and not say anything. Oh, we so busy praising God that we don't care about the fact that you did us wrong to put us in jail in the first place. Y'all need to listen to this to see the word of God is speaking to where we are today. Verse 35. The next morning, this is the after all that stuff happened overnight, right? Next morning, the Roman authorities sent police officers with the order, let those men go. This is the same people that did them, you know, had them beaten and stripped and all this. Let them go. So the jailer told Paul, the officials have sent an order for you and Silas to be released. You may leave then and go in peace. That sounds good, right? Go in peace. Just shut up and go in peace. But Paul said to the police officers, 
we were not found guilty of any crime, yet they whipped us in public, and we are Roman citizens. Then they threw us in prison, and now they want to send us away secretly? Not at all. The Roman officials themselves must come here and let us out. Police officers reported these words to the Roman officials. And when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were afraid. So they went, get this, listen to this. They went and apologized to them. Then they led them out of the prison and asked them to leave the city. Paul and Silas left the prison. See, they didn't leave the prison until the people that put them in there came and apologized and led them out. That's what I want you to get. And then they went to Lydia's house. See, they were trying to get to Lydia's house in the first place. That's where the prayer meeting was. There they met the believers, spoke words of encouragement to them, and left. So they did get to their prayer meeting eventually. In this story, then, about setting the captives free, there are four liberations, four liberations from four separate but interlocking chains of injustice. There are four liberations in this story. There's first the liberation from exploitation. The young girl who was a slave with the demon possession and the people who were making money, in other words, they were pimping off of that demonic possession, she was being exploited. She was liberated from exploitation by the word of God, the word of authority that Paul and Silas took over that demonic spirit in her. So you have a liberation from exploitation. You also have a liberation from incarceration. Now, the way the story goes, Paul and Silas were falsely accused, and there was no basis in the law, there was no justice in their incarceration. We don't know about the other prisoners. We just know that incarceration sometimes is a necessary evil. Sometimes people do things, they commit crimes or their behavior is such that they have to be restrained from their behavior because of what the, the harm that they do to other people. But there are many people also who are incarcerated who have no business in jail. And Paul and Silas were unjustly incarcerated. So one of the liberations, when the earthquake came, it's almost like God is saying, you know what, I am so, God is like hearing these praises, and God is saying, I'm going to set everybody free, even the ones who don't deserve it. God didn't say, well, I'm only going to set this one free and this one free and this one free. When the earthquake came, everybody's chains fell off. And so whatever was the reason why they were incarcerated, every last one of them was liberated. And then there's a third liberation here. It's a liberation from ignorance. As I said, the jailer confessed his ignorance. He's, he, he was getting ready to commit suicide. And Paul said, no, don't commit suicide. Even though you're being held responsible, you're accountable for us. We're all here. So don't commit suicide. Then he says, well, what must I do to be saved? And so he is liberated from his ignorance. And that's an important liberation, the liberation of the mind. The chains may bind your body. The exploitation may bind your social situation, but ignorance is the chain upon your brain. And that chain is broken in this story. And then the fourth and the final liberation is the liberation from collusion. I don't know how many of y'all read the newspapers, but if you're not familiar with that word, you're going to increase in your familiarity if you watch the news, if you listen to the news, if you read the newspapers, if you follow even on social media what's happening. The word collusion is now entered into our vocabulary. What is collusion? Collusion is a secret agreement to deceive others for a deceitful purpose. 
That's what collusion is. So what happened was the police officers and the judges had gotten together and said, we're going to lock these men up. And it also had to do with the people who lost their money when they see the crime, okay? The crime that Paul and Silas committed was that they set somebody free. And when they set that young girl free and the people saw that they couldn't make any more money, they colluded with the police and the judges to get them locked up. That's how collusion works. And so in this story, we have a liberation from collusion because at the end, Paul and Silas, especially Paul, saying, uh-uh, you're not going to just walk away from this. You're not going to treat us this way and then just tell us to go in peace. We're not having that. We're going to get an apology. In other words, Paul pulled the covers off the collusion. That takes courage. To pull the covers off the collusion. Lord, give us courage. But there's some collusion in the camp. Paul and Silas set the girl, slave girl free from demonic and economic exploitation. The devil was exploiting her and the people were exploiting her because the devil had exploited her. Paul and Silas set the other prisoners free by their praise. All the people got free, were incarcerated, got set free. And then Paul and Silas set the jailer free from his sinful ignorance. When they answered the question, what must I do to be saved? They said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be baptized. He said, I'm going for all of that because I want what y'all got. And then he was kind to them and showed, he demonstrated that he wasn't just, you know, sometimes people want to be saved. They're just responding to the emotion of the moment. But by the time they get home, there's not any commitment. But the jailer is showing, I'm changed. I'm going to show you some love. I'm going to show you some hospitality. I'm going to try. Sometimes you can't undo the injury you do to other people. But sometimes you can. You can make it better. It wasn't his fault they got locked up. He's just the jailer. He wasn't going out recruiting people for the jail. The jailer is just responsible for taking the people that get sent there. So he was not the one that locked them up. He wasn't the one that beat them. But he was the one who took responsibility, not just for their chains, but for their wounds. And he ministered to them after they gave him an answer to his question, what must I do to be saved? And then Paul and Silas set the magistrates free from their bondage to the cult of secrecy and the system of collusion. So what I want to show you is these four levels of liberation, you got people at all levels of the society. The the young girl who is a slave is kind of at the bottom. If you're a slave, you're at the bottom. That's the lowest rung of the ladder. And being a female doesn't help. So she's at the lowest rung of the ladder. She gets liberated first. Then you have the people who are incarcerated. We don't know who those other people were. We don't know why they were in prison. But we just know that prison is not a good place to be. And chances are that there were other people there because they didn't have the wealth or the means or the um, influence to uh, get their prison sentences uh, commuted or to even get justice. So we don't know how they got in there. But that's another level of people who get set free. The jailer, at least he got a job, right? And he's got responsibility. He has some authority. He's a higher level, but he gets liberated from his ignorance, the chains on the mind. But then the people who are the highest level of this story are the judges and the officers, people who are authorized by the law. But because of the collusion, they're not concerned about justice or legalism. They're concerned about lock them up because they, they, they made it possible somebody to lose their money. Because, you know, there's always, it's always a money thing in there. And so the system, these are the people who serve the system that kept people in chains. That's why I say it's an interlocking chains of injustice. 
All of these chains of injustice related to one another. So Paul and Silas, I'm just trying to show you, by their testimony, their witness, their courage, their truth-telling as Christians, they're addressing injustice at all these different levels. They're speaking the truth to set people's minds free. They're speaking the truth to set people's spirits free. They're speaking the truth to people's social situation. And they're speaking truth to power. So who set Paul and Silas free? Who set them free to pray, to teach? Who set them free to preach salvation? Who set them free to praise at midnight naked and bleeding in the dark to sing praise? Are they crazy? And they were in the, you know, they were in the, they weren't in the regular jail. They were in the worst part of the jail singing praises. Who set them free to do that? Who set them free to speak truth to power? Who set them free to demand justice openly from a network of systemic injustice? God did it. God's agenda. They were going to the prayer meeting, minding their own business, going to prayer meeting. All this stuff happened on the way to prayer meeting. And they went through all of this. And roughly... 24 hours later, they got to the prayer meeting. But look at all what they accomplished because of their willingness to sing God praise at midnight. And when you think about, I mean, we all have to go through stuff. You can't go through life without having to go through stuff. But instead of complaining and whining and worrying and, and, and wondering and feeling sorry for ourselves, you, you just get, it's, it's like, they're not feeling sorry for themselves. They're saying, okay, God, we're going to praise you anyhow. And when we get through praising you, we're going to still have the courage to get in somebody's face and say, you did us wrong. In the name of the Lord, you need to fix this system so that there's some justice in this system. Instead of us having to have all these funerals and having to have to uh, 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 bathe all these wounds, you need to fix this system. Because the God we serve is a God of justice, not a God of collusion. That's the devil's specialty. So once we get sick and tired of collusion, then maybe we can get ready to be set free and tell the truth. Same God whose truth will set you free. Gives you the authority of the name of his son, Jesus Christ. They did all this in the name of the Lord Jesus. In fact, did you know that this this is one of these texts that lets you know, and I'm going to be finished in a minute, but did you know that the devil has sometimes better familiarity with Jesus than the saints? Because when, when Paul spoke to that demonic spirit, the demonic spirit knew who Paul was and knew who Jesus was. And he said, oh, yeah, these men are pre- preaching. The, de- the devil even knows who Jesus is. But the name of Jesus is an authority that we have as believers, but we don't always exercise that authority. It's like you're given authority in the name of Jesus, and that your enemy recognizes the authority more than you do and can make you fearful. Or make you or exploit your greediness, your fear, or your anxiety. And the power of the Holy Spirit is operating all through this story because the assignment of the Spirit is to set people free. That's the assignment of the church, is to set people free. And stories like this will help us to get a better understanding of how it works But don't be too narrow in what you see as incarceration and bondage. And don't be too narrow in what you see as our assignment. Because in this story, if you buy my interpretation, there are a lot of places where people need to be set free. And there's a lot of word that God gives us to enable us to be operating and effective in those places. I'll close with this. Fannie Lou Hamer. Maybe you never heard of her. Fannie Lou Hamer organized poor black sharecroppers 
back in the 1960s. They, uh, these are people who are the descendants of African Americans who had been slaves and could tell you the whole history. The, uh, cotton was king in Mississippi uh, before the Civil War. And many African Americans, most of the people, African Americans who were slaves in the United States were in the state of Virginia. Virginia was the state that was really the heart of the Confederacy and the state that had the most African Americans. But when the cuts, cotton doesn't grow too well in Virginia. You might grow tobacco in Virginia, but you ain't doing too much with cotton in Virginia. But when cotton became the basis of the global economy, it was Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, those deep southern states, they, sent, they started sending all the slaves down there to pick cotton. The descendants of those slaves were the sharecroppers because after slavery ended, the sharecropping system was designed to keep those people picking that cotton and keep them in bondage. Exploitation, all about money. It's about race, but it's primarily about money because nobody care about your black skin if they're not going to make some money off of it. I don't care what color you are, but you set up the system based on color because the whole global economy was based on that cotton. So the people, the sharecroppers then, they're a couple of generations removed from slavery, but they're still poor, they're in debt, they're illiterate, they can't go to school, they can't vote, they can't do nothing. So Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, this, when the people started coming down there to give them a word of liberation to help them, the young students and different ones, and they were like, well, y'all can vote. And so she said, I can register to vote. So she started organizing people to register to vote. That was her crime. And she got arrested. And she was jailed in a place called Winona, Mississippi. Now, I have no idea where it was, but it sounds like somewhere you don't want to be in no jail. Winona, I don't know, might be a nice place, but I wouldn't want to be in jail there. And they tortured her and beat her through the night. Her crime was registering people to vote. And she was locked up and beaten and cursed and threatened. Like they made the plans that were how they were going to kill them and dispose of them. I'm talking about collusion. The police officers, the jailers, the, the so-called judges, because judges also call it justice, but ain't no justice in that system. So here you got Fannie Lou Hamer beaten into submission and silence. But the next morning, she woke up singing a song. And I'm just going to read the words of the song that she sang because I have a record of the song that she sang. A friend of mine wrote a book. Charles Marsh wrote a book about uh, God's Long Summer. I use it as a textbook in, in my teaching at Howard University. And you can read all about Fannie Lou Hamer in the first chapter of the book, God's Long Summer by Charles Marsh. But here's the song she sang. After she had been beaten, she didn't have anybody bring her food and, and dress her wounds, by the way. In fact, some of those wounds she carried to her grave. Here's her song. Paul and Silas was bound in jail. Let my people go. Had no money for to go their bill. Let my people go. Paul and Silas began to shout, let my people go. Jail doors opened and they walked out. Let my people go. Who's that yonder dressed in red? Let my people go. Must be the people that Moses led. Let my people go. Who's that yonder dressed in black? Let my people go. Must be the hypocrites turning back. Let my people go. Who's that yonder dressed in blue? Let my people go. Must be the children now passing through. Let my people go. I had a little book he gave to me. Let my people go. And every page spelled victory, let my people go. Now, there's a whole lot going on in that song. You got let my people go. That comes from Exodus, right, Moses? Because Moses was a liberator, great liberator. Um, the, the, the Bible begins with this great story of God liberating people, let my people go. So how did that get mixed up with Paul and Silas? She said, well, she was all mixed up, wasn't she? No, 
she had a comprehensive view of liberation. The deliberation, the liberation action of liberating action of God to set people free from bondage is throughout the Bible. And it all connects together. If you believe that the chains of injustice are interlocked, guess what? The chains of liber the, the, the word of liberation is interlocked. And so she was singing about, she was identified, she knew the story of Paul and Silas. And she's like, I have just had a Paul and Silas experience, so I'm going to sing about it. And they didn't shut her up either. And she kept on singing. And she sang in such a way that all the people in the jail could hear the song that she sang. And she sang about the hypocrites. She sang about the people passing through. She sang about the book. She knew the book. You know what book she's talking about now. The book where every page spells victory, that's the book that we need to be reading. And see, we don't have the excuse of can't go to school, can't read, can't do math, can't learn. We don't have that excuse. But we have a, a book where every page spells victory. So we have no excuse to languish in our chains. But we need to shake them off. And allow the Lord to use us in every way to speak truth, to power, to empower, to bring to voice the people whose voices have been silenced by their oppression. But also to recognize that in the name of Jesus, we have the victory. Let us pray. God, we thank you and praise you for your word for your truth, for these exciting stories about the, the, the chains that fell off miraculously when you shook the earth, when your people sang praises to you. God, we pray that in our time you will teach us how to have that diligence, that loyalty, that commitment, that focus that Paul and Silas had, not letting other people's actions and accusations and entrapments to stop us from praying, from praising you, from being empowered by you, from uh, uh, accessing the power in the name of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit, not only to set ourselves free, but to preach the gospel of liberation. Liberation from ignorance, the chains on the mind. Liberation from the chains that bind us and keep us in a certain place where we can't operate socially and financially and politically and economically. God, we pray that you will give us the praises, give us the words, give us the information that we need to shake the bondage off. And God, help us to have that same kind of authenticity of spirituality that the jailer had. That as you set us free, we are quick to minister to others. We will use our freedom to minister to other people. Give us, God, that diligence that Paul and Silas had. They weren't too busy going to pray to help somebody to stop and address the needs of somebody who was in bondage and despair. God, we pray that you will give us the compassion that will be a counterpart to the collusion. Because even the colluders have a soul that needs to be saved. So give us the superpower of intercession that is necessary, that even as we speak truth to power, give us the position and the authority to speak salvation and wholeness and peace, even in the highest realms of the society, that wherever you send us, you give us a word, you give us a mission, and we will be faithful to it, not fearing any man or any system, but only subjecting ourselves to the authority of Christ. For he must reign until all enemies come under his feet. And God, you have promised that we will trample the enemy under our feet. Give us the authority. Give us the courage, God, the kind of courage and boldness that Paul and Silas had so that we can meet injustice and we can promote and advance your kingdom in this world is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I don't know if there's anybody here today, as you've heard this word, this, this word is speaking 
liberation to your soul, to your heart. We want to end with an invitation to discipleship. Maybe you say, today, I want to be safe. Today, I want to be a part of Third Street Church of God. Today, I want to be a part of what God is doing in the world, what God is doing in the nation's capital. I want to be in, a, in that wave of liberation that is flowing to us even through the pages of Scripture and into our present time. I'm going to ask if everyone would stand for a moment. And I'm not sure if we're going to have, we're going to have music or we're going to have, okay, we're going to have some music. But please stand if you're able. And I just want to give us an opportunity. If you would like to come for prayer, don't want to um, shut this down without giving you, giving you an invitation, giving you an opportunity to say, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be set free? What must I do to use my liberation to make a difference for someone else? Is there anyone with desire to have prayer today? Any others? There's one. Is there another? Is there another? God, we are so thankful for your word. Thank you, God, for these three who have stepped out of their seat. You know the desire of their heart. You know, God, the gifts and the abilities and the purpose that you have ordained for their lives. And we pray, God, that you will enable them to be illumined in their understanding of their mission, of their purpose, of their gifts, of their abilities in light of your agenda. And your agenda is to set the captives free. And God, we just pray that you will help us all as a church to get on board with your agenda, to reject the collusion, to reject the greed, to reject the exploitation, and to stay focused, oh God, on the courageous proclamation and living of your truth. For whom the sun sets free is free indeed. So unburden us, God, from the chains that bind us. And recognize, oh God, that when we speak freedom, when we speak truth, we bring our whole lives into line with the move of your spirit and the accomplishment of your purpose in the world. And so we're expecting, God, that especially these people who have come forward, that you're going to bless them and anoint them and use them mightily from this day forward. Thank you, God, for your word. Thank you for the example of Fannie Lou Hamer and how she continues to inspire us so many decades after she has gone on to meet you, God, just by her courage, God. And she showed us that you don't have to have credentials and degrees and connections. All you have to have is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and trust in your word and a song. And you can move mountains. Thank you, God, for the mountains she moved. And just give us her courage. Give us her truthfulness and her transparency, God. And, Lord, give us her stamina not to be intimidated or discouraged by all of the obstacles and the challenges and the injustice and the unfairness, but more determined to live free, to speak freely, and to promote freedom. God, make us liberators, we pray, in your kingdom, in Jesus' name. Amen.